You know, Bernie talks about uh, a lifetime of struggling with temptation and falling into temptation. Who here struggles with temptation? And I'm not talking just temptation of pornography, you know. Temptation to boot the family dog, temptation to buy too much stuff on Amazon. Who here likes to shop on Amazon? There's got to be here. Oh, yeah. So, you know, or porn, or gossip, or money, or control, or whatever you want to plug into that thing. But we struggle with the temptation. And so what I want to share with you a little bit tonight is partly how God has designed us. One of the reasons that we struggle with temptation is because we tend to function in ways that God hasn't designed us to function. So how did God design us to function? Matthew 22, 37 to 40. You're, you will always hear me teach these two teachings when I'm doing a seminar because they're foundational. Somebody came to Jesus and said, what is the most important thing? And Jesus said, the most important thing, the greatest commandment is this, that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. So what I want you to think about is this. Here's God right here. And we were designed for this relationship with God, an open and free relationship with God. If we go back to Genesis, we see how, uh, how God created Adam and Eve in his image, turned them loose in the garden in utter and complete and total freedom. Wow. Awesome. Then they were uh, also, Jesus says, now there's a second commandment like the first. And that second commandment is that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. And so when it comes down to this relationship here, there's, you know, we can stick Adam right here. There we go, right? And we can stick Eve right here just for the sake of propriety. We'll stick a dress on her right there. So we're designed for this relationship, both the relationship with God and the relationship with each other. And the first temptation that we see shows up in the garden. The devil shows up. And the devil comes along and he's very strategic and he has a very specific purpose. And that purpose is to break us away from our relationship with God. So he comes to Adam and Eve and he says, I know God sort of said, don't touch the tree, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat that fruit. But he says, you know, no, no, God knows that once you touch that, you will be like him. You'll know the difference between good and evil, you'll know all this kind of stuff. And so he tempted them, and it says they ate the fruit. And the moment they ate, it, they ate the fruit, what did they do? They abandoned their, de their dependence on God. This is how we were designed. God designed us to depend on him. And when they abandoned their dependence on God, the first thing that said it was guilt. And so what do they start doing? They start trying to cover up. They make uh, clothes out of the uh, most uncomfortable material they can find, and they go hide in the bush somewhere. God comes along a little later on for his daily connection with his children, and he cannot find them. And he's going, oh my goodness, what did they do? So that's what he calls out. Adam, what are you doing? Why are you hiding from me? This is unnatural behavior. You didn't do what I told you not to do. Well, <laughs> and what's Adam do? He goes, well, Lord, the woman you gave me. And he starts blaming Eve, and he starts blaming God for his failings. And that's where pride was born. Bernie made the comment about pride. What is pride? Pride simply, it's not arrogance. It's not, you know, there are numbers of types of pride. I'm better than you are. That's arrogance, right? There can be false humility. Oh, yeah, well, I'm more humble than you are. Whatever it is. Essentially, pride is when we make it about ourselves. We say, you know what, God? I will do my life my way for my purposes by my strength. That is pride. It is called self-dependence. That's what breaks us away from God. See, God, when he designed us, he designed us for that relationship. And knowing that out of that relationship pours the power to have the relationship with each other. The moment the relationship with, with God was shattered, we lost our ability to be really in a relationship with each other in an unselfish way. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. So, okay. So here's the basic temptation. Always the basic temptation is don't depend on God. This is what the devil will always do to you. And Martin Luther, for those of you who are Lutheran, uh, Martin Luther said about the devil that he walks alongside you and he whispers thoughts in your head. Who here has had weird thoughts ever come into your head? Uh, attacking thoughts, negative thoughts, self-destructive thoughts. Those are demonic thoughts. They oftentimes don't come from you. They come from the devil. And what he wants to do is he wants to take you away from your dependence on God, knowing that if he can mess you up here, he can mess you up here. So Bernie shared with us a little bit how as he gave in to his temptation and as he struggled in his own pride, in dependence on his own strength to deal with his issues, 
he continued to fail and fail and fail, and the aftermath of that was shattered relationships in his family. So, James, 5, James 4, verse 6 and 7 says this. It says that God resists the proud person. Who has ever resisted your child as your child wanted to go out and play in the street or do something dangerous? Anyone ever resist your child who wanted to go do something dangerous? Why did you resist that child? The kid says, I want to play in the street. And you're going, absolutely not. Why not? The reason you resist your child you know, in, his, in his selfishness is because his selfishness is going to kill him. So God, it says, resists the proud man. He resists the person that depends on their own strength because he knows if you do it your way, you are going to be vulnerable to the devil and his power. You are going to destroy yourself. But, he says this, he says, God, God pours more grace to the humble person. Okay, so if a proud person is a self-dependent person, what's a humble person? Now, a humble person is not a person that flogs themselves. Oh, I'm a dirtbag, I'm a failure, I'm, you know, you know, I, I remember struggling with this when I was a young preacher, and every now and then I'd preach a pretty good sermon, and a little old lady would come walking up to me on the way out of church, that was a wonderful sermon pastor, and I would deflect her. Oh, no, no, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it was God, it was God, you know. My idea of humility was I couldn't, I didn't even know how to receive a compliment for crying out loud. Finally, one day as I'm deflecting like that, the Holy Spirit really lays hard on me this thought. Just say thanks for crying out loud. <laughs> well, okay then. <laughs> Thank you. And she grabs me and hugs me, right? Anyway, God, it says, pours more grace to the humble. Grace is power. Grace is provision. Grace is what it is that which we need, which we have not earned. God looks at us and he says, you need me. I'm going to pour my strength into you. A person who is humble is a person who is God-dependent. They've already learned that they can't depend on their own strength. They have to depend on the strength of God. So a proud person is like this. I'll do it my way. A humble person is like this. Lord, I'm ready for your strength to pour through me. And it says that kind of a person, the power of God pours through and into their relationships and empowers them to live for him. Okay, does that all make sense to you? All right. So... What I want to do then is, uh, having said that, I want to talk to you just a little bit about how temptation works. So I'm going to... Uh, anyone who wants paper for writing on, stick your hand up and Barb will show you. So, in James chapter 1, it says this, Blessed is man who perseveres under trial. Or blessed is man who even per perseveres under temptation. For once he has been proved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The word that I want to stand out for you there is perseveres. What is it that we persevere at? James chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says, Count it a joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter trials that test your faith. And he says, know that that kind of trial develops in you one of the things is perseverance, character. Perseverance in what? It means perseverance in trusting. It means that when you trust God, you don't just trust Him for a moment and then bail out. So how many of us, we've, you know, we've gone on a bit of a journey, right? We start trusting God, and we know that we've got to go to this point. Just like Jesus. He was arrested here, he had to go to the cross here, and there was a bit of a journey in between. How many of us have started trusting God, and at some point in time we said, enough, can't do it anymore, and we bail out, and we go back to our old ways. This whole idea of perseverance is what Jesus did between his arrest and the cross. It basically says he just kept on trusting God. He trusted him moment by moment. He trusted him over and over. He persevered in trusting. That's what James talks about. He, he says, blessed is that person that just continues to trust God. I don't know what's coming, but I know this. Lord, I'm in your hands. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he does not tempt anyone. Okay? So here we have uh, a statement that bluntly says temptation does not come from God. Where does temptation come from? Satan. What? Satan. Satan. Comes from the devil. Exactly. The devil is otherwise known, and one of his names is actually the tempter. 
So God doesn't tempt us. Temptation doesn't come from God. Now, I find that sort of interesting because if you go into Matthew chapter 4, you remember how Jesus was baptized, and then it says immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for many days, 40 days. So sometimes God, the scripture indicates, will lead us into places where we, we will be tempted. But the temptation doesn't come from him. Uh, do you ever wonder why God leads us into the place of temptation? You wonder why? I've wondered why. God, why did you lead me here? Whoever prayed that why prayer? Why? Lord, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Well, I prayed that prayer over and over again. And, and basically the answer is this. God says, because I'm teaching you how to trust me here, right? I'm teaching you how to depend on me. When I was a kid, Dad gave me a boat. And he sent me out in the lake. Well, he gave me a boat. He didn't really give me the boat, I guess. We had a boat, and I took the boat. Um, and I took the boat out into the lake. And there were things I learned on that boat out in that lake. One of them being is stay in the boat, right? It's the same thing with God. When we think about God, if we live in a sea of sin, if we live in a sea of temptation... And in fact, that's a pretty good image for what we experience in our lives and our society. We live in a, in, a, in a time and in a place where there are many forces out there seeking to trip us up. And what God is saying is just stay in the boat. Just stay in my presence. Just continue to depend on me. So there's this element, God doesn't tempt us, but he does sometimes take us into the place of temptation so that we can learn to trust him there. And the cool thing is, as we trust him there, he says, you, in that place of temptation, are a person I can pour my power through. And that's when we really get to see the hand of God working through us. Awesome stuff. So it goes on, it says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. So as we look at this a little bit, let me grab my, uh, my little eraser here. I want to just draw out for you a little bit of a diagram. So we're given a bit of an equation here. It says each person is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. So let's start out right here. Each person is tempted. First we got tempted, temptation. Temptation comes and it's added to lust. Now what I want to say to you about lust is lust is a craving. So let's, uh, let's just give a couple of quick definitions. Lust, uh, according to Webster's Dictionary, is an emotion or feeling of intense desire in the body. It can take any form, such as the lust for knowledge, the lust for sex, the lust for power, or anything else. It can take such mundane forms as the lust for food is distinct from the need for food. Um, those kinds of things. So lust is that craving. Temptation is what feeds into the craving. So we have temptation plus lust, and it says when you act on those two things, it becomes sin. And sin leads to death. Anyone here know what the definition of sin is? Oftentimes I'll have people say, well, it's when you break the Ten Commandments. Well, that's probably true. <laughs> that would be sinful, right? Um, but actually, Romans 14, 23 says, anything that is not of faith is sin. So sin is actually, whenever you say, God, I'll do it my way. That's exactly what Adam and Eve did. That's exactly what the devil came and tempted Adam to do. Don't do it God's way. Don't do it the way you were designed. Don't live the way you were designed. Do it the way you want. And Adam stepped up and said, I'll do it my way. Took his faith out of God. And that became his sin. And that sin killed him spiritually. I always wondered about that as a little kid. Because the, the thing God said is, the day you eat of the fruit of that tree, you will die. And I always thought, but he didn't die. God just kicked them out of the garden. No, no, they died spiritually. Romans 5 says that in that day, spiritual death separated us from God. And so it kills us. When you want to look at this here, death thing. Um, death. Bernie described a little bit in his testimony the destroyed relationships. The death of some of those relationships. So when you think about it, temptation plus lust acted on equals sin, and it destroys, it kills the relationships that we were created for. Um, so, 
that becomes an important thing to know because for me, I spent a lot of time fighting very much the wrong thing in my life. Now I notice that uh, just for your perspective, I want to draw my picture a little farther to the top. Here's my guy. There's my guy right there. Big shoulders, right? B torso, six pack, right there. And there's his heart. Uh, and no, he's not suffering from a medical condition. That's just for illustrative purposes. He's got a big heart, okay? Uh, the heart is filled with lust. The temptation comes at us from the outside. And the temptation finds its grip on us by playing to our lust. When we, in our lust, whatever it is we crave, embrace that temptation, it becomes sin and it kills us. Does that make sense to you? What a lot of us do when we talk about dealing with temptation, what a lot of us do, we spend all our time fighting the temptation. Temptations come at us, coming at us, and we battle it, and we battle it, and we battle it, and oftentimes we fail. And what God is saying to us in this passage from James, he says, the focus is not on fighting the temptations. Jesus pretty much told his disciples in the Bible, he says, temptation in this world, hard times will come. Temptation will come. Even Jesus himself, for crying out loud, was tempted. And he wasn't just tempted in the wilderness, he was tempted regularly. The thing with Jesus is Jesus never gave in to the temptation. Why? Because he knew what to do with his heart. And he gave his heart to his heavenly Father. And when the Holy Spirit filled Jesus' heart, there was no room for that temptation to take hold. Does that make sense to you? So folks, when we talk about dealing with temptation, it is less about fighting the temptation, and it is more about giving God His place in the lust of our hearts. And we allow Him to become Lord there, we allow Him to exercise His power there, and He changes our hearts as that happens. And the temptations come as the temptations will come. 